Uh, so there's about a 30 second delay. Uh, we're just gonna wait for the 30 seconds to make sure it's working. Mary's gonna tell me when it does. Uh, I think this time I've got it set up so that I can use uh, the microphone instead of the camera microphone, so it should sound a lot better. Uh, if it ends up not sounding better, then uh, I'm also recording it in the background, so I, when I do the YouTube version, I'll have the better audio this time. Uh, let's see, so I got questions already. Let me go to those. So there's about a 30 second delay. Oh, there's me talking. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Cool. All right. So it looks like the delay is all set up then. All right. So the first question comes in from Oliver Linton. Uh, he has a general question. How did, how did I get into the gaming industry and why did I want to? And what would I advise to any aspiring game designers who want to get a job? Um, so let's see. At the time I finally got into the industry, uh, I had been wanting to be a game designer for a long time. Uh, I remember when I was nine years old, I told my parents I wanted to work for Nintendo. At the time, I wanted to be on the the one nine hundred number, the helpline, doing tips because uh, I didn't understand how games were made. I just thought like fairies and robots made them or something. Uh, so uh, it's just always been something I wanted to do. Both Tony and I had talked about it a lot in college, and how when both of us were done with college, we were going to make it happen. And uh, at the time, I was working in phone tech support uh, at Earthlink, which is kind of ironic if you think about the 1-900 number thing. Um, and uh, my mom knew that uh, getting into video games was something I wanted to do. And she had met with an, a former student of hers. She's a teacher who knew somebody at Insomniac Games uh, and had heard that they were looking for testers, uh, you know, doing QA. And so I got an interview and then got the job and then there was no promise or anything that I would get any other job after it, but uh, people had said, you know, if, if you do a good job uh, and you show aptitude, we can, you know, maybe give you some other work to do and see how that works out. So during the whole first project, Ratchet and Clank one, I was doing uh, testing. So I was, I was doing QA and then also I was doing junior design tasks like placing crates and uh, uh, thing, uh, things like that, junior programming tasks too, because at the time I didn't really know whether I wanted to be a designer or a programmer. Um, so that's how I got in. Uh, and it, I, I think it ends up being that way for a lot of people, just sort of a unique way of getting in. Uh, but there are some patterns, especially for game designers. Um, if they don't already have an industry job and they're moving laterally into game design, uh, then there's a couple ways. I've, I've seen people who go to uh, game design programs like at USC or um, the Guild Hall at SMU in Texas. Uh, I've seen people from different programs, Carnegie Mellon, for example, uh, all get jobs as designers in the industry uh, just you know by virtue of the fact that they've finished projects and they have things to show and they can talk about uh, in the interview enough to show that they understand uh, the subject matter well enough to be taught it. Uh, you know, because because when we when we hire people, we're generally assuming if this is their first game, we're going to have to teach them from ground zero. But if they've already got some idea of what goes on, uh, that goes a long way. Um, there's also, uh, I know people who got in from modding communities or uh, I've heard of people coming in from uh, you know, being a fan and writing something that the, the, the studio really liked and they ended up on their writing team. Um, even some people, uh, uh, you know, who, who made something really cool, put it on YouTube, it blew up, and then a studio noticed them. But it seems like in general, that's sort of like winning the lottery. You happen to, uh, uh, to do something that gets noticed. Generally, what's going to happen if you're the kind of modder is you're going to be using those as an example of the kind of work you can do, especially if you have something that's finished and out there, uh, so that they can look at and see what that tells them about your skills. But still, it's going to be your first job. They're going to be assuming they're going to be teaching you everything. Uh, so it's it's still the same sort of uh, job you're aiming for. You're just taking different routes into it. Um, for me, I got into that job 
through test, right? I was, I was working in test and I sort of sidled into that job. Uh, there's also, uh, I mean, nowadays with tools like Unity or Unreal, like anybody can make something, right? And if you actually practice making things and make a lot of things and make some things that are good, you can use those to get your entrance way into that job, that entry way designer where they assume you don't know anything. Um, and the other way is just to apply. Uh, I've also I've seen people who've had no experience, no port no portfolio, nothing like that. They just apply based on their personal strengths, and they're applying to entry level positions. Usually, that's something like junior designer, or uh, oh, what do they call it somewhere? Um, associate designer. It's usually something that indicates it's an assistant role. And what you're doing as a junior designer is you're you're being given very little parts of the game or parts of the game that senior designers are kind of overseeing your work on. And, 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 and then you move up from there. So that's sort of the job you're angling to get, uh, trying to get into design. Um, so basically, if you're doing that, what you do is you go and you look uh, at job listings. So there's a, there's a website called uh, gamedevmap.com, and it's a map of game developers. Uh, I think it might just be uh, North South America. I, I'm not sure if, if if Europe and Asia are on that list, but uh, it has a list of all of the developers and publishers and stuff in 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 any given geographical area. You can click on that. You can go to their websites and see if they have entry level design positions, and then basically look at what they're asking you to do. You know what what they're saying. These are the kinds of things we're going to want you to. Uh, to do on this job, right? And then start trying to do those. Teach yourself how, or you know, uh, uh, if you're in a, a school program, try to get them to teach you how. But just uh, make sure that you're getting stuff that you can show people, or at least when you're talking to them, that you can show that you understand what you're talking about for for those kinds of skills. And the reason I'm not mentioning specific skills is junior designer is very different at every. Uh, every studio, just like I've been talking about on my podcast with the different designers and um, programmers, it's, it's not the same, right? So uh, it'll give you an idea of the skills overall that they're looking for, and you can try to find what niche you want to fill, and that'll give you some good uh, information. Uh, especially in the industry, the AAA industry, designers are very specialized nowadays, so uh, just looking at one job might not get you an idea of all of the skills that might be applicable for any job. So looking, look at a lot of them and see any that you fit already and apply to those. And any that you don't fit, try to get the skills uh, that they're asking for. Uh, let's see. So then I've got another question here from Aiden Price. Uh, hey, Mike, what's the best way to approach balancing the cost of weapons and items in a game like Ratchet, is it okay that players can't afford every weapon in the game, or should there be a surplus of money to ensure that they can? So I think what it sounds like you're asking, and, and you know, post another question if, if that's not it, but uh, it sounds like you're asking whether for a game like Ratchet, it's better to have a loose economy where there's a lot of money relative to the cost of things to buy so that people are constantly buying things, or a, a small amount of money so that people have to uh, go farm to get enough money to buy something. And in the case of a ratchet game, it's the answer is actually both. We just do that, uh, we do it differently with different aspects of the game. So like uh, the, see in ratchet our goal was that we, we always wanted the player to feel like they were making progress. We never wanted to take any progress away from them. Uh, that's why in, in Ratchet games, when you die, you don't lose all the bolts and experience points that you had. Like any, everything that you gain, you keep, regardless of whether you die before you get to a continue point. You know, All of these decisions that we made, we made because we're very consciously trying to make sure that the players uh, 
that they they never feel like you're taking something away, right? So knowing that, we you, you'd think we'd want a looser system, right? So that the, the players would continue to feel like they're, they're being rewarded. But what we found was that when that happened, people wouldn't actually end up going and buying more weapons. Uh, I don't know whether that was true for any type of combat game, but it's definitely true for, uh, for the Ratchet and Clank type games is they would just find a weapon that they liked and then, you know, if, if there was so much money they didn't have to buy anything, they generally wouldn't. So we had to figure out some way of making it so that uh, there was this feeling of having enough, but also occasionally requiring you to get caught up to where we want you to be if you're lagging behind. So we, we did this different ways in the different games. Like in Ratchet & Clank 2, we really upped the difficulty by about the 16th level of so, or so out of 20. Uh, just put a huge difficulty spike so that if you hadn't been doing it already, you'd have to go back and buy additional weapons and uh, uh, armor upgrades and different uh, things like that just to get through the level. Uh, in later games, we did that, but we also changed how loose and how tight the economy was at that point in the game. So, like, if you think, uh, you know, up until level four, these are the sets of weapons we're assuming the player is using. So there's maybe four weapons, right? And then in the next level, we introduce another set of four weapons, and those are on a completely different level of price tier. But also, now that you've gotten to that level, we're, st we're upgrading you to an uh, uh, increased reward production, right? So you're getting more stuff, and the prices are higher. So we're always trying to keep it so that you know, you're getting more stuff in kind of a jagged way, and the prices are getting... Uh, increasing that way so that sometimes the player has too much and sometimes they don't have enough. Uh, and this ends up being very difficult to do uh, and that's one of the reasons why we had those arena challenges was uh, in addition to being like a super fun way to play the game, uh, they were ways that the player could go get more resources if they got them slower than we thought they should without having to just go play stuff that they've played over and over again. Um, the, we had a whole bunch of things in the games like races or arenas or space combat that we wanted the players to do a whole bunch of stuff in that series, but we didn't want them to, um, we didn't want them to have to do that in order to proceed one level. Right. We didn't. So say, let's say there were 10 race challenges. We would make one. You'd have to complete the easiest one and then you can keep going through the game. But we would tune the economy so that if you went back and did, say, another four, that would give you a huge boost in the number of bolts that you would get to buy future weapons. So everything in the game is sort of wobbling between very loose and very tight. And we're trying to strike a balance so that at some, po at some point, you're always thinking, okay, here's what I'm saving up for, and here's what I'm doing with my money in the short term. So you have kind of two sets of goals, and what those are change over the course of the game. Um, so then I got another question uh, from Daniel Rasmussen. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. If not, just let me know. Uh, how is the work on AI split up between programmers and designers? I would assume it's pretty different between studios. Yeah, it is. It is pretty different. Um, I can tell you about how it's worked at uh, Bionic and Insomniac, which are the two studios where I had a lot to do with uh, AI design, and like at that at that very uh, low level. Um, generally, even on projects where we were scripting, what we would uh, designers would have a very high level approach to AI uh, on these projects. So we would say things like, uh, okay, so in general, we want the enemy to start here and they, we want them to play a parachute in animation, then run behind this cover point, and then after that, start using their, their built in behaviors, right? And we would have already decided by talking with the programmers that their built in behavior is, is things like, using clues that we leave in the environment and the position of the player and other enemies uh, 
at any given time when he's given a choice of what to do, what does he want to do? And so we as designers then go and we set up all of those clues in the environment that, that tell, you know, this is a place where it's okay for you to go behind cover. This is a full cover place as opposed to a crouch cover place. Um, so we're setting up all of the little uh, the metadata pieces that the, the enemies are then going to use when they're, they're doing their clever thing to try to figure out what they're going to do. So we're, we're taking a high level concept with it. So things like uh, my enemy designs would say, okay, I want a guy, um, he's a big robot and he has a hammer. And what he does is he, he, uh, you know, he, he waits for one second when you trigger him, then he tries to move within three feet of you. When he gets within three feet of you, he does a telegraph and a slam. And as soon as he starts the telegraph and the slam, he's, uh, uh, he's not going to be re-aiming. So the player dodges at that point, finishes the slam, wait for a second, and repeat, right? That may be all I want out of an enemy. Or I may want something more complicated, like what I was talking about before, where the enemies have uh, uh, you know, more detailed knowledge about the environment and know, OK, in general, uh, to give the player the right feel of experience, here's what we want to be doing. We want three people to be shooting at the player at any given time, and the other people to be running around. So have this sort of overall management system that makes sure that happens. And then if someone dies, take someone out of there running around and put them back in shooting. Like there's, there's a, you can see that kind of high level, but still detail oriented um, interface with the, the, the AI. Now all of the point by point, uh, like the actual code usually about how that happens is usually done by programmers, not always. But like the code that says, all right, uh, I'm standing here. Uh, I want to move to here. How far can I move in a frame? OK, I can move this far. So I need to calculate the vector from here to there and multiply it and you know, scale it by this amount and then move him that much this frame and make sure to animate the walking animation by another, you know, the really deep down stuff. That's all handled by systems and, and stuff that programmers have created. And, uh, and generally, any really intense AI work that requires a lot of learning or figuring out, generally that goes to the programmers because they're going to have more abilities to optimize it and make it run fast on whatever equipment we're using. Uh, so, so for practical reasons, designers are usually not doing very low level implementation stuff. But we will, for example, set up you know, the path that the enemy will run on and we'll say, okay, this enemy will be right here and this enemy will be right here and here's what they're going to do and here's when they're going to do it. So our interface with it ends up being uh, uh, more strategic, like the designer of a role-playing game as opposed to you know, the, the player having to think of everything. The designer's only thinking of the, the, the broad rules. The programmers are actually going in and figuring out what that means in terms of math and animations and all that stuff. Uh, let's see if I got any more questions. Uh, I did not. So I think that's going to be it for this one. Um, I should have the uh, bo tonight's article out, hopefully tonight, and uh, tonight's podcast out tonight. But I might be late on one or the other of those and get them out on the first. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, that should be about it. I mean, uh, hopefully, you all have uh, enjoyed this month of the Patreon. I'm looking forward to the next one as well. So I'll see you then.